We're going to pray before I start preaching this morning. (laughs) Isn't it great to know, just to be reminded over and over and over again how human your pastor is, you know? (laughs) God is incredible, isn't he? He just reminds us how human our pastors are. So hallelujah. You know what? Um, Let's pray. God, I love you. And God, you make me excited about tomorrow. But you make me nervous sometimes about what you have for me to say day in and day out. And God, I think maybe that's why my words are getting confused and mixed up. is because I feel like this week you have just hammered me with convictions. God, that this week has been a week that you have just thrown things at me. You have challenged me in my walk. You have thrown things at me. And, and now as you've asked me to share some of those, I think I'm just nervous where this message is going to go this morning. And so God, I want to pray that as I preach... And as I share what you have laid on my heart, that I not stumble as I do in announcements. But that it will be crystal clear, because it will be what you want me to say. God, this morning, I was reading the words of man, but I'm about to read the words of God. Help them to come out with the same power that you intended them. I love you, Jesus. Calm my spirit this morning. Amen. Amen. God is so incredible. I had the privilege this morning, we, we hadn't realized, it, not everybody had realized there was no Sunday school, and so we did Sunday school this morning, JJ wasn't here, and so I did Sunday school. And I wasn't sure what I was going to share at Sunday school, and I actually shared all of the stories this week about how the Holy Spirit has convicted me on the exact same issue. I think we got to number eight before Sunday school time ran out, that, that at least eight times this week, the Holy Spirit, God, through different means and methods, has come and said, Rick, here is something that you need to start learning. Here's an area in your life where you need to shape up. And it's been uncomfortable for me this week, uh, but it's been incredibly, incredibly exciting. As a matter of fact, I was sharing this week that I, I, I said we are praying because I believe that there is a difficult revival coming. Those, no, those are no, not... Words you normally hear together, difficult and revival. Revival is supposed to be exciting and difficult. Well, that's just not exciting, is it? But I believe that as the Holy Spirit is leading, we are going to be going through a time in our church of incredible revival. But part of it starts with the message that God is teaching me today and tomorrow and the next day. We're doing a study, if you guys are new to the church, we're doing a study on the Holy Spirit. And over the last two weeks, we've talked about the Holy Spirit what the Holy Spirit has physically been credited with doing in the Old Testament and physically credited, like biblically credited with doing through the life of Jesus. And I told you guys this week we're going to be taking a look at what the Holy Spirit has do- did in the book of Acts. And so we're going to do that, but it might take a different turn or a different spin because as I have studied and been challenged, uh, God is doing things in my own life. I've titled my message this morning, Sacred Fire, the Holy Spirit sacred fire because of course if you know that if you, if you read the story of Pentecost and the, and the tongues of fire come down these this holy fire this sacred thing that is sacred and 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 and, and holy and it is that fire and we're going to get to that but before we do that I better do the things that I told you I was going to do we're going to talk about what we have learned in the last two weeks and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts so let's do that let's do a bit of a review this morning and a, my first slide here is called the unchanging work of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. You see, as we studied two weeks ago, we realized that the Holy Spirit is called God's Spirit. And that it is credited, it was the Spirit of God hung above the earth, before the earth was even created, the the Spirit of God was there. The Spirit of God is a part of God, and the Spirit of God is God. And we need to recognize that incredible nature of the Holy Spirit, not simply just the, the Spirit that gives us fruit like love and joy and peace, which are important, but there is something more holy and more long lasting and more sacred than that. The Holy Spirit is a part of God and is God. The Holy Spirit is given credit throughout the Bible from the beginning until the end of supernatural works and gifts such as miracles, prophecy, healing, protection, wisdom, and knowledge done by the Old Testament prophets, by Jesus, by apostles, and by the New Testament believers. We looked at how Samson in Judges 14, 6, it said the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, empowered him to tear up a lion. Like you could tear up a goat, and we said, like, I don't know how to tear up a goat, but apparently it's a lot easier than a lion. And so it said that the Holy Spirit gave him the power to tear up the lion. There was a man named Bezalel, 
In Exodus 31, verse 1 to 5, who was given wisdom, he was given understanding, and he was even given artistic skills to bring people's eyes from the earthly unto the heavenly. You know, we don't often talk about the skills that the Spirit gave, and I wonder if the Holy Spirit still gives skills like that. Maybe there are people who are given supernatural skills that will lead people in worship through the artistic abilities, through the, those things, when they choose to use those skills for what God has given them. them. And I think what an amazing story about this man who had skills to bring people's eyes from the earthly to the heavenly. In Numbers eleven twenty nine, 29, we heard about how the Spirit of God was divided among, amongst the, the, other, the other people around Moses, and 70 of them prophesied. And then Moses said, hey, I wish you could all have the Spirit so you could do all the amazing things that I have done, and you could do all that stuff. And, and we realized that the things that the prophets did... God said they did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they did it in the name of God through the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a part of God and the Holy Spirit is God. And then we saw Jesus in, in Matthew 4 verse 1 was led by the Spirit. In Matthew 12 verse 28 it says this, because of the power of the Spirit he cast out demons by the Spirit. He spoke through the Spirit. He healed through the Spirit in Luke 4, 18. And he received joy through the Spirit in Luke 10, 21. If you took notes last week, I did it wrong. I told you it was Matthew 10, 21. It's actually Luke 10, 21. I fixed that this week. Because once again, I am able to make lots of mistakes. And you have the same grace that Jesus has and will forgive me. Um, and so we read about all these incredible things that Jesus did. He did them because he had, and if you missed last week, we said Jesus had the nature of man. As the nature of man, I can't just heal people. With the nature of man, I can't just do miraculous things. With the nature of man, I don't know what God wants. But God chose to take on the nature of man through Jesus Christ, but the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So all that Jesus did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that he promised us. He, he promised us that same power. In John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, I got to go because... I need to, and, and when I go, you are going to do what I have done, but you're going to do more than I have done. And you think, well, how are we going to do more than what Jesus has done? Because Jesus has done some pretty amazing things. And here's what Jesus says. First in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, you're going to do more. And then in John chapter 14, verse 15 to 18, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. It's important, guys. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help, him, to help you, and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, and remember we said, I underlined him because him is God, because it neither sees him nor, know, nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So what that means is that I don't actually have to read through all the stories in the book of Acts and find every single situation where it says they did what they did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus already told us that all those miracles are done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, I jump into the book of Acts. I say, well, I better double check because I don't want to, you know, speak something that's not true. Um, the Bible says, and that's what God's been convicting me of as well, that this right here is God's words. This is God's words. We've got to make sure that we're using God's words. My words are empty without God's words. And so what does God's word say? Well, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, here's what it says. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, until the ends of the earth. And so, all that the disciples did, all that the apostles did, all the power that they gave, that they seemed to give, and that they seemed to show, and they seemed to have, was done through the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop here for one second, because this to me is amazing. And this to me blows my mind. I, I don't think people understand something, so I'm going to give you a little bit of Christian church context. There is a huge, huge amount of churches in the world today who believe that the power and the working of the Holy Spirit ceased when the Bible was finished. There, it's actually a, a, a significant amount. There is no scriptural basis for that, by the way. 
I have scoured the Word of God trying to find a spot where the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's going to stop doing awesome things. I can't find it. But our human logic says I'm not seeing them. I prayed for somebody who was dying and they died. God's dead. I mean, God's not dead, but, but he's kind of distant. We read all these stories, we say, it can't be real, and so we somehow find a, a logic by twisting and turning, and we find a logic that says the Holy Spirit's not going to do amazing things anymore. But, but it blows my mind because we look in the Old Testament, and the sick are healed, and food is multiplied, and the poor are fed, and all these incredible things happen. Uh, and, and we say, well, that was, that was the Old Testament. So then we see Jesus, who does not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself to become like man, but still, through the power of the Holy Spirit, fed the hungry, healed the sick. He did amazing things. And then he says to us, don't worry, it's not over. And then we look in the book of Acts, and the same things happen. And somehow, we've twisted in our mind, we've found a way within the churches to believe that God is dead, or far away, one or the other. And I think to myself, give me scripture. If this is God's holy word, show it to me that says God is not going to do amazing things anymore. You see, I believe God's going to do amazing things, and so when amazing things don't happen, do you know what that means? It means I need to know God better, because I must be missing something. And that's why we're going to start this study on the Holy Spirit, because I must be missing something. Because I'm not seeing it all the time. And I wonder, am I missing something? And I'm actually excited about the study over the next couple months to know, am I missing something? Because I actually, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning with you guys. I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, and so we're going to figure out what that looks like. But it's clearly happened in the old, happened in the new, happened in Acts, happened in the church. And so I'm going to give you some examples this morning about where the Holy Spirit, some of the things the Holy Spirit did after Jesus went away. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 11, Peter heals a lame man. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12 to 16, the apostles do many signs and wonders. We don't know what all those signs and wonders are, but just imagine what signs and wonders are. What are the signs and wonders that Jesus did? Clearly, signs and wonders are pretty awesome. There's things that we would all recognize, whether that be multiplying food, whether that be healing the sick, whatever it is, it was incredible, and people got saved because they saw the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, verse 36 to 41, Peter raises the dead. I mean, that's pretty much the, that's, isn't that pretty much the ultimate? Like, like, once you've raised the dead, there's not like the next, like, you've done some pretty cool miracles. But you didn't do those miracles. That's, that's the Holy Spirit. God has just said, look, I'm not dead. Paul heals a cripple in Acts 4, 8 to 10. In Acts 28, 3 to 6, Paul gets bitten by a poisonous snake. And he shakes it off. It's all good. And in multiple times in the Bible, Acts 2, verse 4, and Acts 19, verse 6, and over and over and over, People received the Holy Spirit, they were full of the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied, and amazing things happened. And I want to stop there for a minute. We hear about this thing about being full of the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to stop, and I want to let you know something that I, that I, that I realized this week as I read through the, was reading through the book of Acts, and I put it there as a note. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to all, and yet not all were actually considered to be people who were full of the Holy Spirit. Everybody had the Holy Spirit. If you were a Christian, and we're going to get to that in our teaching in the future, if you were a Christian, the Bible says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. If you, if everyone gets the Holy Spirit, right? It's not, it's, 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 it's better than Oprah, right? Somebody said Oprah. I saw somebody mouth Oprah. It's better than Oprah. You know, not everyone gets the gift. Everyone gets the Holy Spirit. But here's the amazing thing. I read through the Bible, and I realized when they were going to choose leaders, for example, they said, look among you. And find men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit. There's something that can set you apart to be full. We all have it. And we talked about the batteries of the flashlight last week. And we said, look, you might all have batteries, but if those batteries aren't full, you're not going to get the same power as the guy who's got full batteries. You know, that's usually me when I go hunting. I forget to charge the batteries, and then, and then I'm like, just moonlight, right? 
But there were men who were known to be full of the Holy Spirit. So those are some of the incredible miracles that the Holy Spirit did. But I actually want to read some of the miracles that we don't like to talk about this morning. That's actually going to be our focus right now. I'm going to talk about two things that are a little bit scary to talk about. That honestly, when I first prepared, started preparing my message, I actually just didn't include some of these. Because um, I thought, no, we'll talk about the awesome things first. And, um, and so I'm going to read something else that happened. In Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to tell it to you. Now the church is growing, and in the church there is a couple, and nobody told them they had to give all that they had to the church. They just went, we love God, we're going to give everything we have to the church, and they went and they sold a field. we got some farmers here, we've been talking about, you know, all that, and imagine how often do you have people in the church be like, not for special projects, like we give to special projects, but here's somebody who wasn't giving to a special project. They just said the Bible says to give. And they went and they sold a field to give all the money to the church. That's pretty awesome. I mean, I don't know what a field costs nowadays. What, like, what is it per acre? A thousand bucks an acre? I don't know. A hundred bucks an acre? Five bucks an acre? I don't know. Over a thousand? So, huh? Yeah, so you, you, you sell a field, you know. Uh, you might have. You might have a hundred thousand. You might have two hundred thousand dollars. I don't know what you sell your fields for. You, so you got a hundred thousand bucks. And they just said, we trust the church, we're going to give the church 100000 bucks because we feel God telling us to sell this field. But, they, but you know what happened? They, they made a commitment to God that they were going to give God this money. And they went up to, to, to Peter and they said, hey, here's the money for, here's all the money that we sold. Now remember, nobody told them they had to give that money. They, they, they told God they would do it. They made a promise to God that they would give this money. They come and said, here's the money. And Peter says, is that all the money? And they're like, yeah. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta expect here something, guys. It's not like they gave, like, sold a field for hundred grand and, and gave twenty. Everybody would know twenty grand wasn't what they sold that field for. They, they, they figured they could trick them. They'd give close to the amount and they'd keep a little bit for themselves. Remember, it was their money to give. They didn't have to give any of it. And they said yes in the presence of God. Yes, we told God we would give it all, and here it all is. And the husband comes first. Yeah, it's all. It's all. And Peter's like, Holy Spirit says that's not all it is. They're lying to the God. And he says, Are you sure? Yes, I told God I would give all my money. Here's all my money. Bam, he's dead. Bam, he's dead. Literally, the story says he fell over. He, because you lied to the Holy Spirit, bam, he's dead. So it says that the, the, church, the, church, the church guys, they come up and, oh, he's dead. So they, they take him out. They don't tell his wife yet. I don't know why. I don't know how this works. I'm not alive that time. Wife shows up. Did you get our money? Did you get our money? Yeah, yeah, we got your money. Uh, but... You promised God you'd give it all, yeah? Did you really give it all? Yeah. You're not going to lie to the Holy Spirit, are you? Nope. I don't know if that's exactly how you can read the, that's, You can read it in your own Bible, the actual words. And bam, she fell down dead. And I think to myself, whoa, that is a scary story. Like, that, that's a bit of a scary story. And, and they didn't even have to give the money in the first place. Like, that's not just somebody not giving a little bit. of that, They didn't have to give in the first place. It, it, this story has nothing to do with money, by the way. It is not an asking you guys for money. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with the fact that... God, you are awesome. God, I love you so much. And I'm so thankful that we have a community and a church where so many men want to help people. God, those guys just got a fire call right now. I just pray that it not be anything bad. I pray that whatever it is that you give, you help them get through it and you help them protect whoever needs to be protected. God, that you just, um, you just bless those guys who serve so faithfully in our community, God. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you guys something. So, so here these guys are. We'll just keep going. Here these guys are. They, they, they die because they did not take God to be holy. They did not respect God as holy and sacred and mighty and powerful and the creator. They just thought, man, God's more like Santa Claus. Just a little bit different, but more like Santa. You know, he gives me gifts, and I can lie to him a bit. It's not a big deal. I can dishonor him a bit. It's not a big deal. I can disrespect him a bit. It's not a big deal. No biggie. And yet, here are these people, they're just struck down dead. And yeah, does God still do that? We don't see God doing that anymore. But I want, I, want to, I want you to think about it for a minute. How do you treat God? Do you really treat God like he's God? Do you treat him like he's holy? Do you treat him like he's the creator and the destroyer? Or do you treat him like he's this fanciful thing in the sky who's making heaven for you? He's more than that. 
And the Ananias and Sapphira, it, it was a lesson about what it's like to not respect the incredible nature of who God is. And God can do miracles. God can raise the dead. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that God still at times raises the dead. I know a man in, in, in Mozambique who read the Bible and said he should pray for the sick. He just prayed for them and they started getting healed. He says he's, he's got the gift of healing. He says, oh my word, God heals, God moves, God has power, but he still deserves our respect. I don't know about you, but I do not like, I love electricity and I'm terrified of it. Anybody here? Anybody here a little bit scared of electricity? You know, I'm a little bit scared. I got, I, got, I got a healthy fear of electricity. I learned that from my dad. My dad, if, it, if there was any electrical problem, dad would not touch it. I don't think dad would change a light, like a, like a, like a, like a plug socket, because he's like, dad did not like, he loved electricity, but did not love electricity. Because when you have electricity, like here in Canada, it's getting cold. Like, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but it's starting to get cold. And come February, if you don't have electricity, you're either going to have to have a healthy respect for fire, or healthy respect for electricity. This, this, this object lesson applies both ways. But, but you need that electricity. But you know what? You don't want to reach out and grab it, do you? You don't want to reach out and grab that, 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 that bear, that, because you know that as life-giving as that electricity is, it has some amazing, amazing power. That, that you hold on to that, you can't even, you hold on to a bear wire, you won't even let go. You're just going to sit there, and your body's just going to twitch, your muscles will twitch, you'll be dead. And you will still look like you were alive and twitching. Why? Because there is power in those hydro lines, and there is power in the Holy Spirit. There is power in God. This word was given to us by God. There is some incredible and mighty power in that, in that. And I think to myself, do I sometimes, this is what the Holy Spirit's been telling me all week, Rick, have you forgotten that I am God? I'm not simply here to give you love and joy and peace. That's part of what I want to give you. But I want you to know that I am holy. I am, I am awesome. I am powerful. That thunder and that lightning that scares some of us. Do you know what? That's not even a glimpse of the power of God. And we need to start showing respect. And by we, I'm mostly saying me. Me, I need to make sure I show this, the appropriate amount of respect for the God that I say that I serve. I am nowhere near my notes. So let's get back to them. So the second story after Ananias and Sapphira is this. There's another person who didn't show respect for the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so remember that the Holy Spirit still worked in the Old Testament. Remember that, right? So for the Jews, they understood that the Holy Spirit gave the prophets their power. And so at the, at the time, I'm kind of give you some context. Jesus has come. The disciples have received the Holy Spirit. The new believers are receiving the Holy Spirit. But some of the old Jewish Jewish people, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so there's a man, he's called a false prophet. Well, if you're a prophet, that means you say that God is speaking through you, right? You're saying, I have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you what God is saying. So let me read a story about somebody who claimed the Holy Spirit and lied that they had the Holy Spirit when they did not. They traveled through the whole island until they came to, pa I don't know how to say that, Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar, Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, the uh, proconsul, yep, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So here's a man who claims to be a prophet, who claims to have the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, God is telling me that Jesus is not the Messiah. God is telling me this, and he's lying. And immediately, claiming the name of the Spirit, without having the Spirit, Paul is able to say, do you not recognize who God is? And this man was struck blind, and I think to myself, we have an amazing God. I love it. I got, I got filled with joy all the time. I, I feel all the time that Holy Spirit just bam, and I wake up and I'm like, woo, hallelujah, I got the joy. 
But I also recognize that sometimes I wake up and I realize that I have not been respecting God. I've been dishonoring God. I'm reminded of, anybody ever have a child who lied right to your face? Like blatantly? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking blatantly lied, you know? Maybe you got a teenager who came home drunk and they're like, I'm not drunk, you know? You're like, just, just be honest. I didn't drink, not even one. I didn't even drink one time tonight. And they are gone, okay? Some of you may have experienced that. And, and you're like, yeah, I'm sure if that's you, you, you just want to like, like, or a kid who's got like ice, like, like chocolate all over their face. And you'd be like, hey, who came into the pantry and ate the chocolate? And they're like, not me. Somebody ate chocolate. Was it you? No. You know what? I'm okay. I'm okay if my child eats chocolate. And they might get in trouble. But you look at me with chocolate all over your face. And you lie about it. Like, do you ever feel disrespect? Like, I never feel disrespected quite like a child with stuff on their face that they said they didn't eat. Okay? And I'm like, oh, I, I oughta. Like, like, it actually infuriates me. And I think I got that from my dad because I would lie like that sometimes to my father. And, um... And he didn't buy it for some reason. And, and we learned in our house that you could get away with almost anything, but do not get away, try and get away with lying. And, and I think about that, like, that incredible... And do you recognize... And I just want to pause it for a minute. And you know how offensive it is when you can literally see the evidence? You could see the evidence. Like, the evidence is right there, and they just keep lying. They just keep... Like, and, and it just makes you... Just, you would never do that, but boy, it frustrates you. I want you to just be reminded of something this morning. Every moment of the day, the Spirit of God is with you. Every moment of the day, the Heavenly Father knows exactly what you're doing. Your face is covered in chocolate. And we pretend that we're so holy. We pretend that we've got it made. We pretend. And, and do you, I can just, I can't imagine. And then we wonder why we're not getting all the things. Like, like, do you think God did not see what you were doing? He's literally right there. As a matter of fact, he's literally in you, and you are rebelling again. You are literally, like, it's like if you, your kid, like, pushes you away. Like, Dad, move. Ah, I'm not eating anything, Dad. You're literally pushing you away and eating them. That's what we're doing to God all the time. God's like, I don't want you to do it. And the Spirit's, like, giving you conviction. You're like, shh. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Why, why don't I have the joy? Why don't I have the peace? Why don't I? Because we're not treating God like he's holy anymore. We don't, we don't treat God like he's holy. We don't treat God like he's 220 volts of electricity, do we? We don't treat him like that. We just hey. And we wonder why we don't get that feeling of the Holy Spirit sometimes. It's because he's like, are you kidding me? You're turning on the lights, but I just saw what you were doing. I saw you shoving your face full of that disgusting chocolate. It's not really disgusting, I guess, but you know what I'm saying. You get the point. And I, and I think to myself, man, that is a conviction. And here's a guy who did not respect the power of the Holy Spirit. And God said to me this week, are you respecting me? Do you know what? I, I'm actually going through, I've started myself. I'm going through the Bible in a year this now. I'm going through the Bible in a year. You know why? Because I realized I was doing a, I was doing a one-verser. I was a one-verser for a while there. Anybody a one-verser? I'm not trying to be mean, but, 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 but like God gives you this like huge, amazing thing. And you're like, nah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'm like, but... He's holy. This word is holy. Everything he's given you is holy. And you're like, nah, maybe. Maybe I'll just pray. Uh, and when we don't treat the Bible like holy, we don't treat the Holy Spirit like he's holy, we don't treat God like he's holy and sacred, we miss out. And so now, I want to read the verses that I intended to read before I started planning this Bible study. Or actually, once the Holy Spirit convicted me, I'm going to read the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. So here they are, they're praying. Remember, it used to be the temple. It all be about the temple. God only dwelt, the Spirit of God dwelt just in the temple but in the temple if you walked through those doors and you had sin and you were even the high priest if you had sin they had bells they had a rope around your leg like you would if you guys studied they actually had a rope on you and so if you walked in and you had sin you walked into the holy of holies they might have to drag you out dead okay that that's how that's the fear they had of God. They, they knew they might have to drag you out dead okay that's the old covenant okay that's the temple and at the day of pentecost is when the holy spirit came to dwell in every believer that we became god's holy temple 
You became God's holy temple. You became that presence of God in this world today. That's who you became. And so in Acts, the tongues of fire came down. I thought, I've heard of stories about fire coming from heaven. And I, I looked them up this week. And there's a very interesting story about fire from heaven. And I'm going to read it for you this morning. Second Chronicles 7, 1 to 3. It's Solomon. He's built the temple. Remember I talked about the temple, the Holy of Holies, where you'd walk in with a rope around your leg just in case you hadn't respected God enough to make yourself holy before you walked in. And they'd have to drag you out dead. So, so that's, that's, they've just built that temple. Okay, right now it's not holy. Right now it's just a temple. It's just a building. The you know, construction work is just finished. You know, you, 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 you dedicate a building. And so they make this big sacrifice to, to wipe away the sins of the people. And they make this sacrifice. And here's what it says. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped God and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. And from this point forward in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was there. The Spirit of God dwelt there, and they could not enter into that place without fully recognizing the power and the might of the Holy Spirit. And it was, it was just an incredible thing. And, and I think to myself, do we realize how holy God is? You're, you're getting this a lot because it's what God's been teaching me eight times, nine times. So if you think I repeated myself today... Just talk to God about that, because he had to like repeat himself like nine times this week. So I'm just following suit. I'm doing what he did to me. Are you treating God like he's holy? And so this morning, uh, praise team can come up pretty soon here. Start making your way to the front. This morning, I have a challenge for you. Do you recognize, do you see God simply as the light switch to give you what you need? Or do you recognize God as the power line coming into the house in the first place? Do you treat God like you treat electricity? Do you treat him with a little bit of healthy fear? Do you treat him with a little bit of healthy respect, recognizing that when, when you open your computer and you're getting a conviction, that is the Holy Spirit, and you are literally pushing him away, saying, I don't have a problem right now, let me get through this. When, 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 you're, when you're talking to other people in a certain way, and you're literally pushing the Holy Spirit, you're saying, Holy Spirit, I don't want your fullness. You're literally limiting, you're tying up the Holy Spirit, saying, I don't want, to, I don't want you. I don't want you to move in my life. And you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to keep studying this, but I believe that as we begin to study this thing of the Holy Spirit, we might realize that part of our problem in the world today is that we do not have a healthy respect for God in our lifestyles, in our, in our actions, in our movement. And, and not just, we talked about faithfulness last week. Am I faithfully recognizing that God wants to speak to me? Am I faithfully recognizing that? Do I really see God as holy? You know, you can try and turn on the light switch in your house all the time, but if you have not tapped in to the power lines, you ain't getting no power. And you can recognize what electricity is, you can recognize how all the power works in your house, but if you don't have that outside power coming in, that fearful, scary, powerful power coming in, if you leave those lines bare, you don't respect that power, you ain't going to have power for very long, are you? And I wonder if we started respecting God with everything that we did so I'm going to say, do you believe, and this is, this is what, what God has said to me this week. So maybe you say, well, Rick, that seems harsh. That's okay. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. I want to tell you what God taught me this, asked me this week. It says, do I believe that God is God? God is holy. Another conviction I had this week was the church is his bride. That's what the Bible says over and over and over. The church is his bride. Do I believe that this is God's holy church? And am I treating my fellow church members like that? that this is God's holy church and that you are part of the holy bride and you are part of the holy bride that God has sanctified, that God has forgiven, that God has purified. Am I treating each other like that or are we fighting amongst ourselves? Am I treating the church like it's holy? Because if God is God and the church is what he says it is, I need to start treating it with the respect it deserves. Am I treating, for example, my fellow elders like they are appointed by God to be leaders regardless of who we always get along? No, they are appointed by God. That is God's holy movement in God's holy church. Am I treating people like God has called me to treat? And I realize sometimes I need to fix my life. Scripture is his spirit-given holy word and will for my life. It is literally God's word. 
for you and for me? Am I treating this with the respect of 220 volts or 120 or whatever we're using here in Canada? Am I treating it with that kind of respect? Am I, am I treating it with that kind of reverence that I actually open it up and I pour myself into this word of God? Because if not, I'm kind of mocking God. It's like, I'm going to get sidetracked here for one second, even little bands up here. Uh, there was a Newsboys song, Big Big House. Is it Newsboys? Big Big House? Audio Adrenaline, Big Big House. And there's an instrument spot in there where, where the instrument goes, does a little, uh, I know you guys won't get it, it's like, uh, it's, I'm not a musician. But when you're running out in the bush, uh, uh, sounds like your dad calling from a distance, like, Ricky, Ricky. And so I couldn't, no, no joke, I could never, I could never listen to that music unless I was in the house. Because I, mom and dad never realized this, but I probably ran into the house like five times one day. Uh, because I kept thinking they were calling. I had such a healthy respect for my dad. A little bit of fear in there too, and it's okay to have a healthy fear that when dad said, Ricky, it didn't matter if you thought it was a, it, a clarinet on some sort of band. It, I'm like, <laughs> Father, Father, what do you want? What do you want? Nothing. I didn't call you. I get back out there and it's like, you know, big, big host. I'm like, Ricky, what? And I'm back and I'm like, somebody's calling me. And, and do you treat God like that? Like, like, even if you're not 100% sure, you're like, if that's God, I want to be there. Like, I don't want to miss anything because I have a healthy respect for God. If God has even given you the inkling of something you should do this week, you should be running and be like, <laughs> like, oh, what, what, was that for me? Did you call me? Should I be doing that? Should I be sharing my faith? What should I be doing? Because I heard, <laughs> you know, like, oh, what? And I would do every time. I, could, I literally, I still to this day, we were listening to it the other day, and, 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 and I said, Heather, I just can't listen to this because I keep thinking somebody's saying my name, like, and that reminds me of dad. I have to go like dad's calling, you know? Like, and I want to see dad that way. I, I want to see the Bible that way. I want to see the Bible saying, get, get to the Bible. Pour myself in. See what God has for me. See what I'm missing. Because I don't want to miss anything. I don't, want, I don't want God to be saying, I called you and called you and called you. Somebody was going to get saved. Somebody was going to get healed. Somebody was going to get raised from the dead for all I know. I don't know. But am I listening to the, am I listening to that silent calling that sometimes you can barely identify? Am I doing that? And I realize that sometimes I'm not. All that I do shows love and respect or dishonor for God. If I believe, in, if I believe he is God, do I live it? Everything that I do, everything that I say. Do I pursue holiness in everything I do? And would I do anything if God asked it of me? I was listening, and I can't get into all that I learned this week, but I was listening to Francis Chan, and he said, you know what, he's, 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 he's a Chinese guy, and he said, he says, the Bible said that Chinese people could never get married. Would I stay single? He said, that's the question for him. He said, if Chinese people, if the Bible said I couldn't do it, would I not, would I, would I, would I not do it? If the Bible said that, 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 that pastors had to stand on their head for three hours every day, would I do it? You know, that's, that's dumb. It might be dumb. But if God told me to do something that was dumb, would I do it? Because God is God. And if the Holy Spirit's convicting you in any area of your life to give something up, to move to something, to, to, to do something, call and call on God and say, I will do whatever you call me to do because when we respect God for the incredible power that he has, the incredible nature that he is, you're going to see God do incredible miracles in your life. God, I love you so much even though sometimes I disrespect you unbelievably. God, sometimes I treat your word like it is just a passing moment in my day, not that it's your life-giving power for my, for my life. God, I want to I wanna confess this morning that I have not respected you in so many ways. And God, I believe there's other people here who have not respected you. If there's those people here this morning, I want you to convict us. I want you to help us recognize that you are who you say you are. That, I, that we come to you in prayer knowing that you have the power, but we also come to you with confession knowing that you have the power. That we come to you for our loneliness knowing that you can give joy, but we also come to you in every area of our life knowing that you are there for us, God. I want to experience the gifts. I want to experience the power, and I want to experience the fruit, God. But I also want to experience what it means to know everything about you. And so, God, I want to confess my sins this morning. I want to come to you and say, God, I love you. Help me be a man known to be full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a prayer team come up. We're going to sing some songs. If you need prayer, recognize that you serve a powerful God. If you need confession, you need, you need somebody to talk to that you feel like it's safe, come and talk to us. If you just need to work some things out, let us know. We serve a God who is God.